want you to take a look at these pictures. What thoughts come to your mind? I'm going to go on a limb here and say, of course, food. But besides that, maybe warmth, joyous, family bonding time, even maybe passion. But by a long shot, I don't suppose anybody said science. Science, technology, engineering, these are words more associated with these stereotypical images, right? And most people can't really relate to these pictures. But most people can relate to food, isn't that right? So I'm here to lay a very bold claim. I'm going to say, where there's food, there's science. You just have to unveil it. I'm going to show you how. My story started in the Silicon Valley of India. And you might have heard that it's one of the most rigid education systems in the world. Growing up, I hated math and science, primarily because it didn't make sense to my everyday life. It was all about learning laws and equations like these, and writing those textbook answers on exams just to get good grades. The real questions I had, they didn't get answered. And honestly, I was embarrassed to ask. After all, if science is supposed to solve human problems, don't you think it should be humanized a little bit more? In fact, if it were, I suspect I would have liked it, even loved it. For that reason, I eventually became a scientist to solve problems. Only it wasn't because of my K-12 education, it was despite it. Let's fast forward many years, and my three-year-old daughter comes into the picture. As cute and adorable as they are at that age, they're incessantly asking you questions, to the point where it's a little bit annoying. I can see some nods there, so you know what I'm talking about. And it isn't because they are trying to be annoying. It's quite the opposite. They're organically curious. They want to learn. They're like sponges. They want to soak up the knowledge that you can give them. In fact, if you think about it, they're actually like little scientists because that is the first trait of being a scientist, asking questions and then trying to discover things. Most of the questions had a very logical explanation. Take, for example, this question here about a train's food habits. Now, on the outset, you can just laugh it off and say, oh, that's a funny question by a toddler. But if you just scratch the surface a little bit, it actually has implication that you could talk to them about energy. I didn't do that. I just told her standard answers like, that's how it is, or just because, or, you know, maybe you'll just learn about it later in school. Because isn't that what we do? We just put this away in the few, far away future. That's when learning's supposed to happen. Slowly but surely, what I realized was the frequency of her questions started dropping. And it hit me that maybe, just maybe, when she's actually in school, maybe she'll lose this curiosity, or even worse, she'll be afraid to explore it. And my own school days came rushing back to my memories, and I didn't want that happening to my daughter. So I decided I'm going to do something about it immediately. I decided to just, you know, nothing much, just take dinner time to talk to her, answer things that she needed um, explanation on. Many a times, she used to love leafing through picture books, even though she couldn't read. She had one about a mode of transportation, so she knew of cars and buses, of course. She had not seen a submarine, of course. She's a three-year-old. <laughs> so, as you can imagine, she started asking, what is it? How does it work? Now, the principle of a submarine can be defined in many ways, but the very simply put, it's just density, right? So imagine this. It's dinner time. Your kids are craving maybe a bowl of mac and cheese. Maybe even you. I think it's as good a time as any to demonstrate this principle, don't you think? So let's do it. So here we have egg. This is going to be more of a mac and cheese casserole, not exactly how the picture looks. Sorry to disappoint you. I'm going to whisk some egg. 
make a mess in the process, add some milk, and I already have a greased dish, baking dish here. So I'm gonna mix that up, put it in here. This is actually a very simple recipe, which can be done in a pinch. You don't have to prep anything. Isn't that cool? You put some salt to season it. Add in the rest of the milk. Macaroni goes in there. So does the cheese, stirred in the process. And it's a kid's dinner, right? So let's make it a little healthy. Let's put in peas there. And stir it up, stir it up nicely. Now that goes in the oven to bake for about an hour or so. And by the magic of TEDx, it's ready. <laughs> So if you slice that up, and I'm not going to attempt to do that, I'm going to use magic of TEDx again. <laughs> there we have it. That's density on a plate right there. You have the bottommost layer of pasta, the macaroni, the middle layer of a cheesy custard, and a top, it's a little bit camouflage, layer of the veggies, the peas. But trust me, if your kids are making this, they are going to devour it. You can have fun with this. The ingredients just separated by their own innate densities, and you actually see that happening. You could change the pasta, you can change the cheese or the veggies, you can do whatever you like. Just have fun with it. It didn't quite end there. A couple days after, we were at a restaurant, and we had a glass of ice water on the table. So my daughter looks at the ice, which was floating, and says, Mommy, that's like density. She had imbibed the true intention of science education. Only she hadn't learned it in isolation somewhere. She had learned it as an everyday activity, something that we all do, eat, right? Very often I found myself using elements of food in cooking to actually explain things to her. And she actually got it. Not only that, she started applying it to many other things that I didn't think possible. That's when I created STEM Chef, a philosophy of science through cooking. I tried this out with hundreds of kids, and it was so cool. They not only devoured the science, not the, just the science, scientific concepts, but got this deep sense of accomplishment, like they created something from scratch. Something else also happened. The intention was to keep the curiosity alive in kids for perhaps lifelong learning. But along with that, parents had fun doing this activity and bonding with their children in the process. You know, I have loved cooking ever since I can remember. As a child, you know, meddling around in my mom's kitchen. In fact, I do pop-up restaurants time and again. But for years, I kept these two interests sort of the professional and the personal, the science and the food, separate from each other, until I realized how intertwined they are. Cooking, or in the very least eating, is something that all of us do every day. And you can find inspiration in literally everything. Even epic failures like burnt cookies or overboiled eggs, we've all been there. So why not get a lesson out of it? It's interesting. Life, in general, has a very low tolerance for failure. Take school tests or jobs or your career, for instance, which is very ironic because you keep hearing time and again that failure is the key to success. Well, in normal life, I find that the kitchen actually is a place that is a bit more forgiving of your mistakes. So why not use that as a playing field to just make mis mistakes and, and learn in the process, create, have fun? A few weeks ago, I was at a frozen yogurt place. And the, uh, um, our kids ordered this popular topping called popping boba. It's essentially fruit juice caviar. Maybe you've tried it. So when you bite into it, the fruit juice just oozes out. It's quite delicious, actually. The kids wanted to know, how do you put the fruit juice in there? And we spoke about it. 
In fact, later that week, we did it at home. We made these popping boba at home. They were so impressed with themselves that they want to show off immediately to their friends, like, oh, I can do this. And the friends were impressed, and in turn, they wanted to know how to do it. It was funny, it just set this contagious reaction forward. So how about I impress you right now? So right here, we have strawberry juice and has calcium in it. Very healthy, right? And in this bowl, we have something that looks like a water bath, but it is water mixed with alginate. Alginate is nothing but a fancy sugar made from seaweed. It's essentially a polymer, a long chain molecule, and it's soluble in water. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to squirt some of these, um, some of the strawberry juice right into the alginate bath. And you can see that they're already forming pearl-like shapes. Just for reference, I'm going to squirt some in a plain water bath so you can see what happens. And as you can see, it just disperses as any liquid would disperse in another liquid. Now, you're supposed to fish this out and wash it, but I'm not going to attempt to do that on stage, so I have it ready. <laughs> that is what it looks like. That is your popping boba, filled with juice. And I'm going to try to pop it so you can actually see the juice coming out. There, did you see the squirt? I hope you did. <laughs> That's not going to happen again. <laughs> now, what happened there? was when the alginate comes in contact with the calcium, it forms an insoluble gel. Ah, simple as that. So when I squirted a drop of the juice in there, the outer surface of the, of the juice came in immediate contact with the alginate, formed this insoluble gel, and trapped the liquid inside. That's about it. And if, if I were to keep this for a much longer time, say an hour or two, the calcium that's inside of that drop is going to slowly travel out or diffuse out, and it's going to come in contact with the alginate, just, again, make a gel, but make a much more thicker gel, and this is what it's going to look like. Just a thick gel with a tiny juice ball or seed of juice inside. Now, you may think, okay, kids are sufficiently impressed, but why kids? This can be done something by adults as well, right? So I'm going to give you something to impress and surprise your adult friends with. You can have them over for dinner and then serve them, and I hope it really works because if it doesn't, I don't know what's under that. It might be a major flop. You can serve them a fried egg for dessert except it's not actually a fried egg. It is a sweet treat that looks like a fried egg. That is essentially coconut jelly egg white and the mango yolk made exactly with this same technique. Just use mango juice instead of the strawberry. In a couple of short minutes, I spoke of three scientific terms, polymers, gels, and diffusion. Now imagine having had to sit through textbook definitions of those. I'm guessing more interesting, right? <laughs> the textbook, I mean. <laughs> so I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, that's all great, but I don't have fancy ingredients in my kitchen. And frankly, you don't need them. All you need is a fresh perspective. If you go into your kitchen, look around, and have a fresh outlook on the ingredients or what you can do with them, you might surprise yourself. You don't need to be an expert to talk about science with your kids. All you need is an open mind. So if there's one thing I can leave you with today, it's this. Team up with your kids to be scientists in the kitchen. You might discover a passion you never knew existed. My daughter sure did. Thank you.